Mandarin Blueprint is a program that has brought incredibly new and fresh insights to how to use memory techniques for language learning, in this case, specifically Mandarin. Now, when I first heard about Mandarin Blueprint, I thought, a blueprint? How is that going to work? But I kept hearing about it from Magnetic Memory Method students, and I was so glad when I connected with Phil and we recorded this discussion about how Mandarin Blueprint has taken something that did exist before and refined it, improved it. And if you know anything about mnemonics in language learning, you will recognize what Phil refers to as one of the foundations that they vastly improved. And I can confirm for you that it is vastly improved, and you're going to find out how in this exclusive discussion that we have for you. Now, if you're not learning Mandarin, I suggest that you go through this anyway, because Phil has wonderful tips on language learning in and of itself. And I hope that you will consider learning Mandarin. It is one of the most amazing things that I've spent time studying. And although I'm far from perfect, mnemonics has really, really made that possible. I don't think I would have learned any of it any other way. And having encountered how that Phil and Luke have used some of these pre-existing approaches to mnemonics for Mandarin and seeing how they've just really innovated it in really clever and clear and distinct and crisp ways. I know you're going to love it and you're going to find that if you just go through that thinking for yourself, no matter what language you're learning, there's some cool ideas that will revolutionize how you think about applying mnemonics and memory palaces to the language that you're learning. So please enjoy this discussion with Phil from Mandarin Blueprint. Phil, thanks for joining me. I want to talk all about Mandarin Blueprint, but in your week so far, what has made you feel the most blissful, would you say? Ooh, good question to start off. I think it was probably I was listening to the audiobook of uh, The Power of Now. Uh, right. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, listening to Eckhart Tolle's uh, dulcet tones uh, as I was walking on my morning walk, I was feeling pretty blissful uh, at that moment. So, yeah. Nice, nice. Well, I, was, one. I was thinking of that because we had a chat recently and we were talking about Alan Watts and so forth. And uh, that was just such an interesting thing that you were interested in it. And so what yeah. What would you say is, is there a connection between these kinds of interests that you have and Mandarin and China in general, or just a random kind of thing that happens in the world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm sure there's plenty of randomness involved in it, but I think that my openness to it was certainly uh, to do with, you know, I, I live in Chengdu, which is in the shadow of uh, Qingchengshan, which is the birthplace of Taoism. So I've been there many times and I've been to Taoist temples there. And so there's, uh, you know, when, when I started l listening to Alan Watts, I was pulled in by it because I was kind of like, well, this I think that there is something about this that is expressing itself in the Sichuan basin somehow. It's like the way that people behave and the way that, um, you know, society is structured. It's also a very fascinating, fascinating geographical region, uh, because it's very well defended and also has fresh water and a lot of agricultural, uh, land. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, I think people here have always had this great little kind of life, uh, sort of flow balance that's going on is why I've really liked really enjoyed living here. So I think that there's some connection there, but otherwise it's mostly just, I hear the, the noises that somebody like Alan Watts or Sam Harris or Eckhart Tolle are saying, and I, you know, it connects with me. Right. right. Well, that's great. I mean, however it happens, <laughs> there doesn't always have to be a mm -hmm. reason, but I thought of yeah. it partly too, because you're not only an expert in learning Chinese and an expert in terms of, you know, speaking it and teaching it and all of these sorts of things, but you're an accomplished entrepreneur. And so mm. these kinds of things, maybe, you know, you can speak a little bit about how do you manage to do so much entrepreneurially, learn Chinese to the degree that you have done and just be a chill dude, you know, like how, how is that even possible? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, certainly, uh, habits come into a big, uh, big play here. Um, because I just luckily learned through being a drummer as a, a kid, I started practicing drums when I was nine that, um, you know, you can get 
pretty good at something if you just have daily improvement. And so luckily I learned that lesson pretty early in life. And then with uh, Mandarin acquisition, especially immersion learning, I got very practiced in finding the little gaps in your day that you can fit something in. So, you know, and also recognizing the different mediums that are available to you. So for example, uh, I might not um, spend as much time reading a book, but there's plenty of times where I can listen to an audio book, you know, because obviously if you're reading a book, it's all you can be doing in that moment, really. So, uh, you know, if I'm taking a morning walk or I'm on a run or something, I'll get more uh, Chinese in at those moments, or I'll get, uh, you know, some professional development stuff going. I just try to look at my day and go, where's the possibility for some extra education or uh, where's the possibility for something that is in service of uh, maybe spiritual education. Like one thing I like to do is uh, I, I'm an afternoon exerciser every day around 4 PM. I go and do some kind of exercise running, cycling, or lifting weights. And then I like to sit in the sauna and that's my time to like maybe uh, read the, or listen to the power of now or uh, Alan Watts or uh, Sam Harris or, or so, you know, something where there's um, the purpose of it is simply to uh, con uh, be contemplative, I guess you could say. And so like the, and then I have a meditation habit in the morning. And so like the habits ultimately build up and I, I write every morning. Uh, and so when you just build that up over time, I think that um, that is the biggest factor in being able to I, seemingly juggle so much because it doesn't really feel like that anymore. Uh, but it, yeah, it just comes down to the consistency day to day. And then, you know, as you know, with habits, like eventually it stops even being something you think about. It's just sort of just sort of starts happening as the day uh, begins. So, right, right. yeah. Well, the drumming background is super interesting because, you know, in some sense, the rudiments is, is just such a, a key term in drumming. And then there's rudiments in language learning and so forth. So just as a way of getting into the topic of learning Chinese and what you specialize in over at Mandarin Blueprint, what's, sure. the, what's the equivalent of learning a paradiddle in language learning <laughs> specifically like Mandarin. Sure. Sure. Um, well, you know, there could, you could say it's a few different things, but when you're saying a paradiddle, it makes me think of the learning, the pronunciation principles. Um, because I think that the first step in, uh, language acquisition should be to at least, so, okay, let me like, break, I'll break it down like this in order to acquire a language you have to recognize that the main goal you should be always working towards is to understand messages in that language in you know, whatever way you can. So the only two activities you should really ever be doing are uh, either understanding messages or improving your ability to understand messages. And the only way we can uh, understand a message is we either hear it or we see it. And so if we, or, you know, both together, but it's, those are the two possibilities. And so, that message, uh, if, in order to hear messages properly, you, you need to know how the sounds of the language are enunciated. Um, and once you can recognize that, then you can have the ability to distinguish between things like xiang and zhang, even though they sound quite similar to the untrained ear. Once you know exactly how those are pronounced and that xiang has the, the tongue against the back of your bottom teeth and that there's an e sound in there that zhang, where your tongue is pulled back, and there's no E sound, when you mm. really understand that, then you can hear it in other people. And then you have a better chance of understanding the message. And so I'd say rudiments are kind of like that in the, in, you know, a paradiddle might be like learning the difference between the J and the, uh, the ZH in Chinese as an example. Right, right. Um, and then there's rudiments and getting into characters and you know, things like that. But um, that was my first uh, thought when you said that. Right, right. Yeah, no, I love that. And it raises an interesting issue, though, because there are some people, and I'm not exclusive in this, but, and it's something that I've talked about with our mutual friend, Ollie Richards. I mean, we've talked about it for hours. Mm. It's just, yeah. I, I've heard you say, Daja Hao, right? And I just, I can't actually, mm. I, I can't say it the way you say it. I, I can hear that it's sort of different from having heard many, many people say it. But then there's like this way you say it. And then I can't, quite like figure out how I'm going to model this. And I've done the chorusing thing and so forth. So what is the, I mean, maybe take us back to your first days encountering this language Mandarin and even something like, which I think I just said, you know, like, hello, everybody. Yeah. You know, that sort yeah. of thing. And like, where do yeah. you, 
if we th- stick to this idea of the rudiments and so forth, like where did you start and start to craft this thing that it's sounding the way it's supposed to sound and hearing it as it is, so to speak, in terms of getting mm-hmm. it through your mouth, the muscle memory of your mouth, so to speak, but it's also your throat and, and tongue placement and all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, um, certainly pronunciation is the most like going to the gym of anything that you do in as a language learner, uh, or I should say a language acquirer, uh, because it just, to some degree, there are muscles in your mouth that you just never developed because you weren't using them in your native language. Uh, you know, Chinese doesn't have that many syllables, but about half of them are, uh, going to be novel to a native English speaker. And so y- your mouth should actually kind of hurt in the early days, but luckily <laughs> your mouth muscles are also smaller. So like, if you're going to get like, you know, big, um, you know, biceps or something, it'll take longer than it would to, you know, uh, build up your mouth muscles. So, um, there's that, but I actually started, uh, focusing on characters, which isn't the worst start, but I didn't give enough focus to pronunciation at the beginning, which, uh, you know, if I were to do it again, I would definitely have put a lot more focus on it. I just kind of saw it as an afterthought at first. It was like, yeah, okay. I understand the basics of pinion. I know that like, you know, uh, the, the, C is pronounced not like you would expect or like things like that, but I didn't ever really delve into it, which is Mm. part of the reason that my business partner and I, Luke, were such a good match at the beginning, because that's exactly what he did at the beginning. He focused a lot on pronunciation. He sounds like a native speaker. He's got excellent pronunciation. And so, but he, but he ignored characters. He was like, "Ah, I don't need to learn those characters. (laughs) Right. So we kind of, that's why when we, we met and came together uh, to start collaborating, we were, we, our strengths were, you know, um, uh, quite P pay. Um, uh, yeah. what's, what's the word for that in English? I'm, I'm replacing English a lot of the time. I'm not learning managers replacing English. Um, but compatible, I, that's the word. Um, I don't know. I don't so, know yeah. that, that word yet. P pay, you say? Uh, yeah, P pay. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay. it just means compatible and, and, uh, with between two people. Um, so, you know, so we had these compatible, compatible skill sets and, uh, so, I, but I focused so much on characters, which was lucky because I actually had a, um, uh, Japanese roommate whose um, fiance was American. And he told me when I learned Japanese uh, that I, you know, focused a lot on the characters. If you're going to learn Chinese, I'd really recommend focusing on the characters early. And so he uh, gave me the Heisig book uh, at the time. And I, you know, really got into that. And so that was sort of I guess the early foundations, because once you understand the characters, the language uh, sort of blossoms from there because the hardest parts of Chinese are the pronunciation and the characters, but the words and the grammar are actually pretty easy. In fact, the words are really fun to learn because they're so, um, they're so, they're so clear on the face of it, what they are. Like some of them are built in mnemonics right from the, right from the jump. You can just look at it and go, Oh, what, what is that? Like, for example, the other day I was um, writing, cause I like to spend at least 10 minutes writing Chinese every day, just to keep the output going in that uh, way. And I was writing about the five senses and I was trying to think of what would he, what we call the sense that recognizes thought because, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we've got our sight and our smells and stuff, but that's mostly for the outer world. You know, what we call that perceptual apparatus that recognizes thought. And I thought, oh, how do you say perceptual apparatus? <laughs> I was like, because I couldn't figure that out. And then I just looked it up and uh, it's gan zhi qi, which is so obvious, gan, which means the feeling, gan xing, right? And then zhi, like zhi dao, to know, so like mm. knowledge. So yeah. feeling, knowledge, and then device, qi. So it's a, uh, it's so clear and I'll never forget that because it's just like, well, that's obvious what that is. And so, uh, that the character learning process, what it did was it kept me fascinated with the language constantly. And so that to some degree, that's what keeps you going. Cause it's the activity. It's just the activity, the amount of time you spend in the language that gets you to a point where you can communicate fluently and, and sound, uh, you know, good doing it. And then I managed to get my pronunciation problems fixed later when I learned a lot from Luke, you know, we made this course called pronunciation mastery and I uh, edited it on uh, final cut and I was watching it and I was like, dang, that thing that Luke just said there, I actually didn't know. (laughs) So I'm like having already passed the HSK six and like, you know, uh, had learned a lot of Chinese already. And then I was still picking up on 
pronunciation mistakes. So what I did was I just really focused on it for about, you know, another uh, three to six months of fixing things and being very like, you know, uh, somewhat regimented about it. But if I had just done it right from the beginning, uh, I could have saved myself a lot of that extra fixing time, but it can be done. So if anybody's out there and they're like, oh, my pronunciation has a bunch of problems, you can, you know, you can get over it. It's possible to get through it. But uh, I had to kind of, it's better just do it from the beginning, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing though. We sometimes get so passionate about it that we don't do it right from the beginning, but then there also seems to me potentially a trap. So Mm. how do you, how do you find that your Chinese travels throughout the country? Uh, Do you, Mm. do you have issues if you're in different parts of the country and, you know, people are, huh? Or, 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 or whatever, you know, in terms of just so many regional dialects and so forth. Uh, how how do you sort of deal with that? And how, what would you suggest to someone learning Chinese? Is like, you're going to go for Beijing or or something in the South or, or, you know, you're going to stick with HSK or, or how, how does, how do you grow into all of that mass of complications? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, it is so Putonghua, which is Mandarin is the kind of like, you know, that scene in uh, Lord of the Rings where, uh, Gandalf is telling Frodo the uh, the language of Mordor, and then he says, "In the common tongue, it reads one ring to rule them all." And then that's what Mandarin is. It's the common tongue of China. So wherever you go around China, even if they're speaking like Kujia, which is this dialect in Fujian Province, which sounds nothing like Mandarin, they still probably understand Mandarin because it's been in their schools. It's, I mean, you know, if you're above a certain age, you know, maybe you're older than like, uh, I'd say probably at this point, maybe 55 or 60, there's a chance you don't speak Mandarin at all. But below that, the education system is such that they at least know Mandarin. You know, I live in Sichuan, which is um, where they speak the Sichuanese dialect, which is similar to Mandarin, but it sounds quite different. The tones are a bit different. And, you know, like, for example, I might say, um, just say I'm, I'm eating right now. They'd be like, what's that? Sit there. Right. Which okay. you can see that there's a relationship, but it's very different. But if I say if I start speaking Mandarin to somebody from Sichuan, they just pop right into Mandarin. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's like it's it's one of those things where or they'll speak Sichuanese back to me, but like they're fine with the fact that I'm speaking Mandarin. They'll understand uh, mm-hmm. what I'm saying. So I actually haven't found it to be too much of a problem uh, speaking Mandarin. And also Mandarin is has the most connections to the other dialects because it's so commonly used. So the other dialects have picked up things from Mandarin because it's a universal language. So if you learn Mandarin first to get the principles of how the language is constructed, then learning a, another language can happen almost naturally. Like I understand Sichuanese without ever having studied it specifically. Now I can't really speak it, but, uh, uh, not very well anyway, but I can understand it because my brain has just sort of figured out It's like if somebody was speaking with like a Scottish accent or something. The first time you hear it, they have a really thick Scottish accent. You might be like, what is going on? But then your brain sort of kind of starts to figure out the the gaps there. And, you know, which is, of course, one of the things that is everybody should understand about language acquisition is like there's there's less trying than you think you need to do because your brain is really good at uh, language acquisition already. So like a Mm -hmm. lot of times if you just uh, keep giving it the, the, the food it needs, I guess you could say, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just give, keep giving it the, the food it needs to pattern recognize on its own. You don't have to force it to pattern recognize. It'll do that anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. So anyway, so that's a, a bit of a long winded answer to that. But yeah, I would say that Mandarin is, is well worth it to start with Mandarin and it will be applicable across the country. Right. Well, I asked from my perspective, I mean, I've been to China, but most of my experiences with speaking with people or learning from people, you know, for example, when I did level three at Confucius Institute, the teacher insisted on an N ending and he would not rec- recognize anything that I said with an R mm. ending. Right. But at home, interesting, it's R ending and my wife will not recognize anything with an N ending. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's just yeah. kind of, for me, uh, from my perspective, and then just watching movies with my wife and so forth, it's kind of like, sometimes I'm just understanding pretty good and then other times it's just like what the heck is this is this some other language and i'll even ask her 
is that really Mm -hmm. Mandarin? And I've had the same thing actually in German, which I'm much, much better in German. But even then, sometimes I'll get a get a movie that is from in Plattdeutsch or something like this and just be like, what the heck? Did I ever actually learn this language? So it's Mm. that's the perspective from which I'm asking it. And I just sort of know some language learners, they get thrown for a twist because it's like. That doesn't sound like anything <laughs> from, you know, whatever source, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fun. No, it is interesting. Cause you know, Mandarin is, um, you know, the, the closest dialect to Mandarin is uh, in Shijiazhuang, the capital of Hebei province, but even that is still only about 91% Mandarin. So Mandarin is in a very real way, a manufactured language. Um, you know, th- nobody yeah. speaks perfect Mandarin as their home dialect. Every place has their own words for stuff and you know it's it's pretty uh incredible in that way but that's also the reason why mandarin serves you the most if you want to interact with the various parts of china because you know i could learn sichuanese and (laughs) sichuanese is kind of an exception because everybody sort of knows sichuanese in the same way that we might look at somebody from like alabama and how they talk there and we just we would feel (laughs) like okay they know that you know they're like you know for example uh you know in mandarin you would say hi to to mean like fine <laughs> yeah. or everything's good but in, in Sichuanese, it's hi koi hi koi and like they'll kind of make fun of it on tv like they'll just sort of suddenly use the Sichuanese dialects so Sichuanese is a bit of an exception but if i just learned kujia for example i would only be able to use it there in that particular part of fujian and like you know that would be great if that's exactly where i was going to live and i was going to settle down there or whatever but if i wanted to interact with chinese people around the world i mean mandarin's the way Right, right. Well, that's all, all, all great. And so, Putonghua it is. Um, <laughs> now, in terms of some of the things that hold people back with language learning, I'm shocked to this day, and I don't know if you are also shocked, but uh, to this day, I still hear from people saying, you know, how do I learn grammar in language X? And I'm just thinking, you know, haven't even following all these language learning pros who are just like, get, yeah. get the gone <laughs> grammar or, you know, pick it up later or learn it in context or what have you. But what what's your take? You mentioned that grammar is not that difficult in Mandarin. I think there's, there's one or two quirks. Like sometimes you want to have like the biggest concept at the beginning and you sort of have this like Russian doll process back down to the smallest concept in a sentence, which is kind of like yeah. a little bit of a challenge. But um, other than that, it doesn't seem like a big deal. It doesn't even seem like reading a book on grammar, but what, what is your take on grammar as such? And then grammar with Mandarin. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I think the first thing is to understand what grammar does. So like, for example, there's really only three main things that grammar does it either. Uh, it, it's an analysis of adding words to a sentence to change the meaning uh, or changing the word order to change the meaning uh, or changing the word form to change the meaning. So, you know, uh, good, better, best, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And Mandarin doesn't have any of the third. A character is a character is a character. If you say, it's not going to change its form. You just add things in front of it or behind it to say like, Uh, you know, I ate or I will eat or, you know, that type of thing. And so Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of adding and moving around characters, puzzle pieces. And so because of that, you don't have to, again, your brain will automatically pattern recognize if you put things together. So to use English as an example here, if I say uh, that um, I like basketball and then I say, I like Uh, And I understand that message. I hear I like basketball and I understand that message. And then I hear somebody else say, I like fishing. And then somebody else says, uh, fishing for salmon is relaxing. Um, Then I might one day produce the sentence uh, basketball is relaxing. I don't know. It could be, you know, (laughs) just like, you know, chilling, shooting some hoops. And that sentence might have never been heard before, but because I've heard it, heard these different patterns before it fits, I can go, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. This, this, this pattern of words that I will say perfectly fits the patterns I've observed. And the reason I know it's right. And that the other way of saying it is wrong is simply because I've seen it the right way. I've seen the right pattern hundreds of times, and I haven't seen the wrong pattern at all. So it's like, 
you know, uh, uh, if I said the word, um, I have seen John today, uh, well, I guess that could technically be true. Like, I'm trying to think of a bad grammar, like a sentence you could say that's the wrong grammar. But the point is, if you see, um, if you say something with wrong grammar, the answer of why it's wrong is not because of the grammar rule in your textbook. It's mm. just because you know, it's just a feeling. You just go, well, no, it doesn't sound right. Nobody ever says it that way. And so the solution to acquiring grammar is goes back to the same thing as it always has been, which is just understand lots of messages by either hearing or, or uh, reading, you know? And so the more messages you understand, the more natural a process it becomes. Now I will say this, I said that there are two activities for a language learner to follow. One is to try to understand as many messages as possible. And the second is to improve your ability to understand. Now, an, an activity that improves your ability to understand is like, say, learn a Chinese character, right? Another activity might be uh, learn how to construct a sentence with the Chinese character ba, which is sort of a weird thing that happens in Chinese. You get used to it and it's really easy after you see enough of it. But mm -hmm. maybe reading an article that shows you how the structure is will help you notice it in your immersion or, or in your trying in your attempts to understand messages. And if it helps you notice it, it did improve your ability to understand a little bit, but you can't expect the reading of the grammar rule to give you the grammar rule in practice. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you might read about how to use ba in a sentence, but it won't when the time comes and you're like ready to say, you know, you know, it's, it's not going to be there for you. You're going to go, ah, uh, and I, I have to put the, the object before the verb. And then the result, like all that extra thinking is going to, you know, you're not going to say it. You're going to, you end up just being this Chinese say, uh, 姐姐, 爸爸, which is like when you don't stammering speech and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's my kind of feeling about grammar is you can acquire it naturally in Chinese. It's easier because there are no word form changes. And, um, uh, grammar rules are potentially helpful. You know, Katsumoto once said grammar rules are like kind of pharmaceuticals in the sense that if you have a little bit of it, it could be helpful, but too much is toxic and too much will hold you back. So, right, you know, right. that's a decent analogy, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I shouldn't discount grammar altogether because there are certain things like, you know, hen for very uh, serving as, is and are or however that works you know it's just it, yeah. if you don't know that as a principle then it's kind of hard to um ever <laughs> reckon with it and then start to start to use it so that's certainly um uh, an exception to that in terms of yeah. it being just the right dose of medicine in the right place and uh yeah yeah so what do you do though to sort of build a little bit of an engine when we talk about habits what because everybody's got their own sort of schedule or at least so it seems right we all have the same 24 hours and yeah but we do have our particular circumstances so what do you recommend for somebody who either is already on the path with mandarin listening to this or they are just getting started and they're already thinking man you guys have talked about like 15 different things here it sounds difficult you know like what would yeah. you suggest for day day one and starting to get a little habit stack going that's going to get you somewhere where you actually feel motivated to keep going sure sure so i mean there's two kind of angles at this one is like the specifics of what you can do from day one if you're a beginner in mandarin but from a habit building perspective what i would just recommend is that you first of all you have to be sure that learning Mandarin is something that you genuinely want to do and that you can see yourself in the future speaking Mandarin and you can see like, oh, this is going to be great for whatever your thing is. You know, sometimes there, there are kind of different types of learners. There are some people who are fascinated by the language in and of itself. There are some people who are cultural connectors and they want to do, you know, make a connection to China. Sometimes they have a person in their life, like a romantic partner, or, you know, there's some reason you have to make sure that that's clear because that's what's going to save you when you're not as motivated at the beginning. Most people are like, oh, I'm ready to go, you know, but it's a long enough process that at some point you won't feel as motivated and you need the vision to pull you forward in, in that time. So that's the first thing. The next thing is to uh, decide a minimum amount that you will do each day 
that you is so easy, you would feel almost ashamed not to do it. Like, so you could say, I have to do one uh, lesson on the Mandarin blueprint method, or I, I would do one flashcard or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. something where it's like, of course I can at least do that because at the beginning, it's more about establishing the identity as a Chinese learner and uh, establishing, establishing the uh, behavior as a part of your life, like brushing your teeth. You know, we don't, nobody like complains about having to brush their teeth after they're a kid, you know, it's just sort of like, it's just part mm-hmm. of life and it just happens. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you want to get it to be like that. And you run a risk of overwhelming yourself. if You do too much at the beginning. So like, it's okay to just be like, you know what, I'm just going to learn like one character a day is my first minimum. I'm going to learn one character and then review it. And then that's, that's great. Um, so there's that. And then practically, if you're a total beginner on day one, uh, absolutely focus on pronunciation. But luckily I would just point out that Mandarin pronunciation only has 409 approximately unique syllables. And then if you add in tones, uh, then it's about 1200 sounds. Um, cause it's not just four or nine times five, because some of them never get used in third tone. Away. So it's about 1200 unique sounds, which is small enough, especially since it's only 409 unique syllables, about half of which are really easy, like la or something like that, you know, simple, yeah. <laughs> simple sounds. It doesn't take that long to learn everything about how pinyin works and how pronunciation works. And so it's really worth your time to do that. Like in English, there's about 16,000 syllables or something like that I've heard before. And uh, that that would be too much to do right up front. Like, oh, I'm going to learn 16,000 sounds like out of context. Now you wouldn't want to do that. But with Chinese, you have that as an option. And uh, the, the pinyin chart is very like it's very formulaic. It's like an initial, a final and a tone. And those, those three elements are a part uh, of every syllable and some of them are just finals some of them are uh you know just initials but generally speaking those are the three elements and if you understand how they work that will serve you your entire time of learning like pronunciation never really goes away it requires a lot of folks at the beginning and then it tapers as time goes on as you get better at it but you always think about it so pronunciation would be the very first step that i would recommend that people uh do but don't wait too long to get into characters i would say like once you have a good sense of how pinyin works then uh learning characters is so helpful because that's the advantage adults have we can read so um you know we can be, acquire language faster than kids if we are doing both listening and reading at the same time like it's sort of a myth that kids are faster at learning language it's just that they're less distracted you know, they don't have another language in their head that's taking up, uh, you know, all this space. So, yeah, those would be my kind of sort of habit building advice. But also practically, what should you do? It should be focused on pronunciation right, to right. start. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But what do you think about the the group of people out there who are doing things like Chinese medicine or pressure points or whatever? I just learned the other day, I think it's who, quote, um, this little pressure point on your hand. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know a in, lot about Chinese medicine myself, but I, you know, I, well, apparently yeah. it's like, like Lao Hu as in tiger or whatever. Um, oh, okay. And then uh, the mouth of the tiger, basically something like this. So okay. who go yeah. is this anyway? And like Tai Chi is your ankle or whatever. Anyway, I was just getting into this and I re- realized there's three words for forehead in <laughs> Chinese medicine. I don't know if I can say them probably like, uh, to and, uh, Berto and then yeah, well, uh, no more. Yeah. No more. Oh, there's another one. There's four. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, uh, is the main one. Like, uh, is okay, correct. Uh, and also, yeah. tian, like, tian, like front. So, tian, really? uh, tian? that makes, oh. yeah. Simple. Okay. But yeah. Berto, I guess, is the is the Beijinger one my wife was telling me. And then mm, it's mm. like Nomar or something is another one. But then, oh, I, yeah. anyway, whatever. Uh, but I just wonder about that because uh, there are people who just want it for those sort of purposes. And you know, how can Mandarin blueprint, I guess, is the, is the actual question. Could, is it useful for that as well? If you have super targeted goals, which is almost something I'm quite interested in, uh, as I'm just basic at conversation at home, I'm, I have no reason really to, to be speaking. Uh, but I, I had this idea in my head. It was just like, yeah, what if I just memorize all of the puncture point, acupuncture points or whatever, just to start practicing body memory palaces, which we'll get to in a second, I'm sure. But, um, you know, do you have thoughts about that kind of acquisition, which is a little bit different than Mandarin for speaking, but how you can help people in, in those realms? Sure. Well, I think that 
because characters are, you know, the, you, know, you start to get a relationship with each character uh, over enough time. And when you learn them and you see them in enough contexts, then you start to like, it's, it's sort of hard. It, it, it's hard to answer this for sure, because I, I still kind of come back to, well, you have to build your foundation of understanding the structure of the language through characters, because instead of doing an alphabet, they do this thing called like, we have all these mini meeting meanings. We've got this bucket of meanings called mm -hmm. characters and we just pull out the meanings and put them together to create new words. And which is a lot of legwork up front. Cause you have to learn all these characters, but once you do, then so many things make sense. Uh, like right off the bat. Um, now, I don't know exactly why they would call that the tiger's mouth pressure point. I'm sure that in Chinese traditional medicine, there's probably a lot of, uh, uh, there's probably a lot of cultural reference that's going on there. Uh, so, you know, it, when you have a cultural reference point, that's not the type of thing that you can necessarily see on the face of the characters. But if you know the characters, then you can at least have a starting point to understand. And then uh, in regards to what, like, so for example, I've never really learned the pressure points, but because I know all the characters, I bet if I went through at least some percentage of them, probably the majority of them would make sense because the characters themselves would give some indication of what part of the body it was, or, you know, uh, if there was uh, something about it that connects to the other types of pressure points, like you see, there's a pattern amongst all of them that they share this type of character or they share this type of pattern. And, uh, so I would say, you know, it's hard to just jump right to that without building your foundation first, because, uh, it's just going to be tough, but it's, it's it's also I get that somebody hearing that would be like, oh, so what? So I got to learn three thousand characters, and it's like I would just say that you can have a great time learning the characters. Like the the character learning process can be really fun, and uh, yeah, you don't have to uh, it eventually speak it, but you know if you know the components of the characters, you know uh, how they what they tend to mean, what what sort of meanings they tend to orbit, because a lot of times a character is it makes you think philosophically because you'll go, I thought this character meant, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I thought it meant freedom, but actually it, it in this other context, it's something more like, uh, 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 like freedom of movement or something. And like, so yeah. exactly what concept is this orbiting? Maybe I have to go a level, I have to put, zoom out a little bit to understand what kind of concept this character is, is orbiting. And so if you skip right to something very specific, you might miss out on that a little bit. You know, you might go, okay, well, let me just memorize that this is tiger mouth and like, you know, go from there. But why it might be that way, if you knew a lot of other words that used who, then perhaps you'd kind of start to get this sort of, uh, sort of conceptual framework around it. Um, so yeah, I would say that ultimately learning the characters and taking going through that endeavor is still worth it, even if you want to have very specified knowledge. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Interesting you mentioned freedom. I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, what do you, how do I say it? What a Chinai de Bauber gave me the, uh, the name, Mai um, Tsuyo. So oh, okay. my, my actual Chinese name, it used to be something else, uh, but now it's, now it's freedom, Mai <laughs> Tsuyo. <laughs> so the Mai nice. is for like, nice. but anyway, interesting you mentioned freedom there. Um, so yeah. Yeah, uh, for anybody who missed that, I was trying to say that my uh, my sweet darling wife, uh, <laughs> Chennai de Balbar. Chennai de Balbar. <laughs> oh, bar, it's like a bar. Uh, she called or me. Balbay uh, is also fun. Yeah, that's the, that's the Beijing or yeah, Putonghua yeah, yeah. thing there. But yeah, yeah, I usually hear people say Balbar. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, it's so fascinating. Like the pronunciation thing to me is 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 just the Achilles heel that I haven't really sort of worked out. And part of it is is that I just don't engage in conversation enough. And shockingly enough, when I do speak with her, I ask her, you know, is that correct? Is that even remotely correct? And you know, she'll she'll say yes or no or whatever. And uh, sometimes it it deflates one. Sometimes it boosts your ego, et cetera, et cetera. But I think pronunciation is going to be such a hard thing simply because the time to spend with native speakers. And then also there's the, the fact that they're just so kind and generous, you know, people mm -hmm. in China, they, they will praise you to the end of time just for knowing how to say, you know, like, ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> <laughs> right even trying say, to say if you say ni hao with correct tones they're like oh my gosh yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy's great <laughs> so yeah but it's um it, it i think that do you have tips around 
getting access to people who won't stroke your ego necessarily, but also won't frustrate the heck out of you as you're trying, trying to learn. How do, how do you solve that part of the equation? Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I always kind of go back to this and I, I know I can be a bit of a broken record around this, but it, it's like the way that I got good at pronunciation was, you know, partially to focus on specific things around the principles of it and like, think about where do you put your tongue and, you know, uh, practice, in, in a very sort of uh, focused type of way at the beginning. But, and then there's also things like take, for example, here's a simple one that if people don't know about, they should learn, which is that people focus so much on the five tones, which is a little bit of a mistake, not because they, you shouldn't learn the five tones, but because uh, most words are two characters. So you're actually better served to learn tone pairs and create a tone pair anchor. So the, there's 19 tone pairs. So here we're talking about things like first tone, first tone, you know, fen zhong, the, the word for minute. Um, mm -hmm. There's a uh, first tone, second tone, zhong guo. Uh, there's uh, first tone, third tone, chi hao, right? Like there's just these various different tone pairs that are more like the, if the, the majority of words are two characters, then that's what you should focus on. And then what you do is you pick a word that you definitely are going to always say correctly. Like I never say zhong guo, incorrectly because i've said it so many times right so now if i learn a new word that is first tone second tone while the pronunciation of the syllable will be different the the music of it will be the same the the you know ba 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 zhong guo uh fei chang right so it's like there's different tone pairs you can do there that make it easier to connect there and but the thing is so that's some practical stuff then it goes back to Immersion and input. Like if you want to get better at output, get more input. It's like it, it, there's, I, I've said, I've said this before, but like understanding is the mother of expression or another way of putting that might be expression is the emergent property of understanding. And I like, I mean, this is just how we are from birth. Like as soon as we understand something, we're telling our parents like, you know, oh, and it starts off with just like going like that. Ah, it just means that it's just like, there's an object out in the world and I see it and I understand it. I want to tell somebody it's like the expression is constantly there. And so when it comes to finding a good person to talk to, always go back. If you're struggling with something, always go back to listening and, and, and reading more. But then when you're talking to that person, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of a search that has to happen. You need to find a good tutor or uh, if you want to, if you want to pay for it, or if you don't want to, there are 10 to one Mandarin speakers to English speakers on hello talk, which is a language exchange app. And there's loads of other language exchange apps. So it's a, uh, it's a, a buyer's market from an English speaker's perspective. So you, <laughs> and I say that in jest, I mean, like, obviously it's just a language exchange, but if you find a relationship that you like a language parent is what some people will call this, like where they, they talk to you normally, uh, they don't, you don't want somebody who's constantly nitpicking you. What you want is so like, for example, I might say, if I'm learning English, I might say, uh, 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 the toilet is where, and they'll say, and they'll, the, the language partner would go, Oh, where is the toilet? Oh yeah, it's over there. And so they're not specifically saying, no, don't say toilet is where they just respond to you by saying it the correct way and then move on and keep the conversation going and keep it flowing. Cause you're never going to speak perfectly. Don't, and just don't even worry about that. If, I'm not speaking perfect English right now. Like you, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. never going to speak perfectly. So you just want somebody who tries to keep the conversation going and interesting. And that, that takes a little bit of a search, but it's not forever. And when you find somebody, hold on to them, like, you know, be like, okay, let's keep it, you know, put energy into, uh, scheduling time with them and, and, um, you know, going from there. So, and, and oftentimes this isn't your romantic partner, <laughs> especially if you started off speaking <laughs> English. Right. And so yes. that's okay. Like that doesn't have to be. And if anything, you know, that's, um, that could be a good thing because then you don't have to introduce this like potentially uh, awkward thing. It's like, oh, let's force ourselves to speak Chinese, even though we start like Luke and Nana, his wife, uh, who's Chinese, they still mostly speak English to each other. They speak Chinese to each other a little bit, but you know, Luke's great at Chinese, but they started their relationship in English and it's just what happens, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, I think finding somebody who is uh, a language parent, who is, you know, just 
for whatever reason, you find them on a language exchange app, you find them on a tutoring uh, service of, of some sort, and you like them, you have good rapport, and they don't try to nitpick you too much. Now, maybe if you have a tutor, you can say, after we have the conversation, maybe point out a few things to me that I was saying wrong consistently or whatever. But uh, yeah, mostly just get somebody who just keeps the conversation going and kind of says the things back to you that are the more the, the more correct way to say it. Because when you're saying something wrong, if you keep getting more input, eventually you'll correct it. And you won't mm-hmm. know exactly when those moments happen because they're happening all the time, like as you continue to get more input. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I found in music, you often don't even notice when you're getting better. It's it's just the mm-hmm. consistency. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, I pushed yeah. through that plateau and we weren't even paying attention. But, you know, one thing you said I love, I've never heard this before, the idea of getting tone pairs together. So whatever they might be and just mm-hmm. drilling those, it's almost like uh, substitutions in grammar. Like I walked, yeah. I will walk, et cetera. But now it's just with tone. So that's cool idea. However, I wonder, and I don't know, but you can maybe answer this and it doesn't have to be that it's a trap, but it just instantly, I'm always like looking for the traps. <laughs> what sure. you didn't do with Sandy, right? Because there's, there's a s- pretty significant amount of Sandy in Mandarin. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't find, I don't find it that hard. There's three primary rules. Uh, the one rule is around E. So um, if I, if you have uh, e come when it's not a digit when it's not a numeral because it's it's the character for one is the horizontal line, uh, but sometimes it's saying something like like ilu ilu shunfeng which would mean like ilu means your entire journey so it kind of mm-hmm. a lot of times if you put e before something it means the entirety of that thing right so it's like that thing as one is the way you could think of it right and when so lu is fourth tone so when you it comes before a fourth tone. E changes from first tone to second tone. E lu, and it's to make it easier. So, like tone sandy makes it easier to say things. If you say, if you say e lu, that's a that's kind of a, your first tone, fourth tone is a, one of the harder ones. It's one of the harder ones for our English brains to do. But e lu, e lu, that's like very natural up down, up down, you know. And so uh, there's that one. And then of course, if it comes before a first, second, or third tone, it changes to e fourth tone. E qi, we mm-hmm. e qi qu. Right. You know, so like that kind of E fall, falling down and then down to qi, e, qi. So that's one rule with, with, with that. And then the other one's with bu. So again, bu is fourth tone. But if it comes before another fourth tone, then it goes second tone. Bu shi, bu cuo, right. So there's all these different things, but it's so natural. You get so used to it. And if you mimic people, you go, oh, yeah, bu shi. I'm going to say that all the time. I'm going to say, no, not that. <laughs> or uh, bu cuo. like that's like, hey, not bad. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. So many opportunities to say uh, second tone, fourth tone with bu, and again, easy tone pair up down. And then the only other one uh, that's frequent, I mean, there's other like very sort of um, super detailed ones that I think shadowing deals with. But uh, the other major one is the there's no no such thing as two third tones in a row. Uh, mm-hmm. And so if you have uh, you know the the character actually the word ni hao is two third tones ni. Hao, but you don't say like that. You say ni hao, ni hao, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and if you have several, if you have three third tones in a row, um, uh, uh, it, it's kind of like is third, second, third, or second, second, third. And you just kind of get used to it. Like you just got to practice it enough to get a sense of it. And then, just like the tone pairs, it maps onto all the other uh, words that you learn with just the different enunciation of the syllable but the, again the music is the same so uh you get you just get used to that um over a long enough time and you know take for example saying yo mayo yo mayo mm. people say that all the time it means have or not have do you have mm. or not have something yo mayo well that's the tone that's the three third tones in a row rule i mean may technically is the second tone but it's the same ultimate product because if you had three third tones in a row that's how it sounds ba 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 ba, right? So yo mayo, ba ba ba. So you just kind of attach to something you already know and is easy to say, and then you just apply the principle across the board. And I find that if once you've done that, you know, I don't know however many times you might do that over uh, a year, it just becomes second nature. Right, right. Cool. Well, let's talk about memory palace and the uh, you know just to frame it. I've heard about 
Mandarin Blueprint for a long time, and people tell me there's some memory palace stuff in there and some memory oh, yeah. work that they're doing. And you know, what do you think about it? And I think I think it's great. But you know, how do you mm-hmm. how did you come into it? And you know, what's your secret sauce on location based mnemonics? Sure. So, uh, well, we were first introduced to it by James Heisig from remembering the simplified Hanza or the traditional Hanza. And he originally wrote it to be a kanji book in the 70s and then mm-hmm. uh, worked with Timothy Richardson to make a book uh, about it in the um, in the early 2000s or in the noughties. I think it was 2008 when the first one came out. And so that book is the introduced us the basic idea of like, OK, you could imagine the the primitive elements the components of the character are like objects and then they're doing something but he kind of kept it at that and they're doing something to express the meaning of the character so if this character yeah. means uh you know uh food stuffs then you know shu the uh then that's the meaning that you're trying to express through the actions right um but he didn't do anything with the pronunciation so he was basically just like okay you're going to learn the meaning of the character and you're going to learn the components of the character, but you don't know the pronunciation automatically, right? So through the mnemonic, right? So we, I did the first 1500 characters back in 2011, 2012 or so, uh, and but I didn't do the pronunciation. So I just drilled the pronunciation rote style after that for the first 1500 characters, which is flashcards, just SRS flashcards, just going, okay, uh, sure, this is sure, this is sure. But then... Uh, we discovered a blog post called uh, The Maryland Method by a guy mm-hmm. named Sergey Gorodish. And he was applying a principle to remember the pronunciation of a character to do on top of Heisig. So it's basically uh, a situation where the pinyin initial is represented by a face, a person, and the pinyin final is represented by a location of some sort that's related to you. And then the tone is the room within that location. So uh, for example, let's just pick um, here's a, here's one sha, which means to uh, break. So sha chu means to break your on a car um, and, or on a bike actually, because chu is just any vehicle in Chinese, but um, so sha chu. And uh, so the, the 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 character there for me is Sherlock Holmes, and um, uh, he it's uh, he's outside the entrance, which is first tone. So it's Shatu, uh, it's first tone. He's outside the entrance, and he's got a sword, which represents the right side component, and uh, he's stopping the um, the wheat stalk, <laughs> which is the left side component for me. It could be something totally different for everybody. Everybody could have their own props or whatever, but he's stopping the uh, wheat stalk which is basically screeches to a halt right because it like a car would if it suddenly had to stop and break so i came up with that brief scene years and years ago for whatever reason i still remember it many of my scenes of like I, do, I don't need to remember them anymore so they're they're gone but uh that is an example of how you can take sherlock holmes representing sh my apartment on fairmount avenue representing a outside the entrance representing first tone the sword representing the right side component, the wheat stalk representing the left side component, and then it breaking represents the meaning. So it's essentially six things in mm-hmm. that case. Sometimes it's seven if there's a third prop, a third component. And so we um, basically realize, well, wait a second. If you can memorize the pronunciation as well as the meaning, then you could expand this beyond just characters. You could say, okay, well, now we have this character and its pronunciation and its meaning and you learned this other character and its pronunciation and its meaning, and you put them together and they create a high frequency word. And so now you can learn that word and you can learn that word in a way that's a little bit less systemized. It doesn't have to be as like, you know, uh, it can be just more connected to your personal memories and your lived experience and just sort of, you know, okay, I'm going to learn the, the word for uh, and so I'm going to imagine that Motorola razor, which was my first phone, you know, as an example, and I'm going to put maybe an image of it in my flashcard or, or uh, I'm going to make some other kind of connection to that. But that's something personal to me, but because I already learned Dian and Hua properly through this uh, method, um, then 
it, the, the word learning, first of all, it's kind of obvious in itself of itself, electric words that connection to a phone is not that surprising, but then it's also like you add in this personal connection. And so now what becomes possible is for you to get comprehensible input through reading very early, which was never possible before Mandarin blueprint in the same way, because what we did was we said, okay, we're going to learn through the mnemonic technique to learn a character. Then you're going to put those characters together to create high frequency words by level 13. You've learned 105 characters and 85 words. We can now put them together into comprehensible sentences and bam, you're understanding messages. You're starting to understand messages without pinion and while being able to, uh, you know, solidify the characters by using them. So like there's one way to solidify them, which is to use the memory palace. But then once you start actually using them, you'll eventually get it in the same way you get any word in your native language. Like there, there's a certain point where you no longer need to, you know, kind of have any kind of studying. It's in you got it. It's it's part of you. And so um, essentially what we built was a better like Heisig on steroids because it teaches you the pronunciation. And the problem with Heisig was that because he didn't think you could learn the pronunciation at the same time, he introduced certain really high frequency characters quite late because mm. they have complicated components. Like, for example, na, the character for that. Well, the mm. left side component of na is kind of a unique component that's only really used in that character and na, which means uh, where uh, mm. or which. And so he introduced that character 1,432. I always remember that because that's way late to learn such an important character. But again, mm. he thought, well, you can't, it's impossible. It, so he thought to learn the pronunciation at the same time. So who cares, really? You just got to learn these characters eventually and you'll figure out the pronunciation later. So we said, now nah, we got to reorder it now. And so we reordered everything and uh, built out the uh, what we call ACLO, the optimal character learning order, which unlocks words, which then unlocks sentences, which then you get later into the course phase four, the sentences, oh, turns out they were actually a component part of a little paragraph. And then again, at this point, you only know about 200 characters or so. So it's way earlier than most people would be able to get comprehensible input. And now here you are reading a little story and then you get a little bit later and we do like three little pigs or um, Cao Chong Cheng Xiang, which is a uh, Cao Chong weighs the elephant, an old uh, Chinese fable or Sima Guang Zha Gang, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sima Guang smashes the vat. And like these, like three little pigs, it's like, it's kind of like three little pigs, but in the Chinese version, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're teaching that stuff. And then you reach a point where you can start to actually immerse in native content. And that's what we want to get people to. Like, that's the real, that's the real thing to get to. Because once you start immersing in native content, that's what makes you great. That's what makes you not just understand, but like go, oh, I can mimic this guy on TV, or I can uh, start to see the three different layers of this character. Because we mostly just teach the primary uh, pronunciation and the primary meaning. But once you have that, then you can, the, the rest of the context surrounding it allows you to learn the secondary and tertiary meanings of, of the character naturally without having to put too much effort into it. So basically that's a rundown of what we were trying to do to get the memory palace to like, basically the memory palace unlocked that whole possibility because it made it so that you could in one 30 second, you know, sometimes 10 seconds, depending on how quickly you do it. Um, visualization you now know the meaning character uh, or sorry the meaning pronunciation and writing even not that you need it but you can you'll be able to write it uh of the character which then allows you to uh put it into a word which put it into a sentence put it into a paragraph and then next thing you know you've got it down for life right right well it totally makes sense to me uh <laughs> but it's uh certainly something i wish i would have had back when i was starting because there, you're right. I mean, the criticism of Heisek is, it's not worth criticizing necessarily. Uh, and not that you did, but I have in the past sort of criticized it, but it's just so, so it was astonishing to me at the time that he would mm -hmm. divide the character from pronunciation when it's so obvious for these sorts of reasons, not only that, but maybe we talk about this a different time, but one thing that I, I have done and I would do more again, because I have the systems to do it. But if people have number systems, then you can put, you know, your two tones together. If it's, if it's three and four or what, whatever the case may be, then you could have an image for 34 that you pack into there, which is maybe too much of a step for beginners in memory techniques. But once that you have a couple of memory systems, it's like nothing to just add on 
a number pair because you're going to have one, one, or one, two, one, three, or one, four, or whatever. So if you have a zero, zero to 99 set of images for that, you've got it all covered mm-hmm. already anyway. So it's just a matter of putting it in there. Um, yeah. But, you know, at the level of a sentence, it can be tedious, but uh, it just. Yeah, you- well, I, I found it's not necessary. And it's not yeah. to say that you, you couldn't do it, but here's why. Because, you know, the mnemonic scene you make for the character, like, Obviously, there are some characters that have multiple pronunciations and there's some getting used to that you need to do there. And if you mm-hmm. want, you could add on an additional scene to represent the new pronunciation and the new meaning. Although I actually find it's most even that's not necessary most of the time. It, there are really some amazing times where I can't believe that I know that it's supposed to be the other pronunciation. Like, for example, here's an, a perfect example. Of this: There's a character, Shung, which is the character for province. And it's also the character that means to save time or money when it's pronounced shung, but uh, the, it can also be pronounced xiong. And the time I learned that, the first word I learned that for was fan xiong, like fan xiong zi, which means to reflect on oneself, right? Uh, and then I saw, while I was reading one day, the, the phrase bu xing ren shi, which means to lose consciousness, to faint, right? I'd never seen that before, and I knew the character was pronounced Xiong, not Sheng. And the reason is because pattern recognizing machine here, it recognizes that the, the meaning that is being expressed in this book that I'm reading is not saving time or money. It's not province. And it's related to consciousness in some way. And so Fan Xing Zizi means to reflect on oneself. It's got to be Xiong. And that's all me ex post facto explaining what my brain must have done automatically. Right. And so anyway, that's tangent, but going back to uh, the the point about why you don't really need to put in the extra effort to go like, was this a second tone, third tone, or, uh, you know, type of thing is that because the original scene was in a room that is always third tone or always second tone. Like for example, it's first tone outside the entrance, second tone in the kitchen, or if there's no kitchen, just inside the entrance, uh, and then of whatever set that it is, we like to think of it as just it's a set for your uh, your mnemonic visualization. And then third tone is usually the bedroom or the living room. Or if you don't have, if, if it's not, a, if it's like a workplace or something that doesn't have those, just any third, any other room. And then uh, fourth tone is the bathroom or the backyard, either, either one. And so if you're in the bathroom, there's a toilet. And if there's a toilet, it's fourth tone. And so you remember it so easily because it's so instant. Oh, there's a, there's a refrigerator in here. It's second tone, right? So it's like, the, it's so fast. And so you don't forget it. And so when you see the new word, what we do in Mandarin Blueprint is we don't add any pinion if it's the same original pinion. So if the, the first uh, word they unlock is, is yi ban, because uh, they learn yi, er, san, shi, gan, and then ban. Right. Mm-hmm. So because they're related by components. And so then we say, OK, you've now learned E and ban. So that makes a word E ban. And we'll just say, you know, ban. It, we didn't say it's something else. So, you know, you can know it's Bill Murray in the bathroom of the Anderson Street apartment. Got it. You know, so it's really mm-hmm. it's really quick. And, as, and of course, that's just mine. Everybody picks their own uh, examples, you know, so a beautiful image. Definitely not E ban ban. <laughs> <laughs> love yeah. it uh, I'm done. so um yeah okay that's cool that that that's really quite refined um i well anyway i i, I can think of certain certain avenues to question around such as mm. okay so how much space do you practically have in one bathroom for example or are you mm. helping people gather infinite bathrooms as i would <laughs> i would do like i would say you know you run out of bathrooms go watch stanley kubrick movies because every stanley kubrick movie has a, a one yeah. pivotal scene that takes place in the bathroom i don't know what it was with stanley kubrick but you never have to run out of bathrooms <laughs> if you watch stanley kubrick movies <laughs> you know that kind of thing do you yeah how do you solve for that uh, equation so to speak sure so peppered throughout uh the first two phases of the mandarin blueprint method uh we talk about um what we call special effects, but we just, it's basically just the different things you can do when you need inspiration. And so one of the things we talk about is uh, sort of widening the space. So you kind of imagine that everything proportionally become moves out, 
but it gets bigger. So this is a perfect example for me in my first apartment in Chengdu. I had a very small bathroom. It was like just the, you know, basically just the shower head and the toilet. And that was it. So small. So I can, I just imagine that the floor is expanding and the, the walls are expanding out in that way. And uh, I can still tell it's my bathroom because there's still the toilet and there's still the, the shower curtain and there's still the, the, you know, the, the um, shower head, but there's more room now. But I also find that I don't even, I mean, there's often a Kodak moment of like, this is kind of the spot that this is when all the things are happening, when the, the person and the, the set and the place are like creating the meaning. And because of that, even a small space, I find that it's very possible to do. Now, another thing you can do, this is why we also have the option of the backyard, because sometimes that's just easier for whatever reason. Like one of my uh, sets is the um, Sam Ash in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, where I used to work. And there was this spot behind the drum shop that uh, I just liked to use that for fourth tone and not the bathroom because I have more memories being back there on breaks and, right. uh, you know, chatting with the other drum shop guy. And there was where we received shipments and stuff. And so I have just more stuff going on in my head there. So I'm just like, I'll do that for that particular uh, set, which represents EI, the final EI. And uh, so you have that option as well. But I find that it's it's easier than you think. You can blow out a wall. Just be like, let's just get rid of this wall and just uh, imagine that the bathroom extends on beyond that. Because um, you got an infinite budget uh, in your mind to create these. You're like, we like to think of them as shooting movie scenes, which uh, I, I know that you and Victorious Mind, you were kind of like, I don't think it's like shooting a movie because a movie stays the same. But the way I just think of it is like, is that reshoot the scene if it didn't work you're always allowed to edit you're always allowed to yeah, move, yeah, yeah. move things around <laughs> and whatever because i just find the metaphor is so helpful it's like actor set and prop and the script and special effects those yeah, things yeah. all have to be involved uh, and the special effects are optional but they help you when you're you know uh struggling to come up with an idea so i think we have like 26 or 27 special effects that we teach people well let's pause on that for a second because i think mm. your insight would be quite useful here i think you're totally yeah. right i mean Movie is a perfectly acceptable thing. The reason I problematize it is because, well, first of all, that's what I do is just like theorize about things, right? And the, I like the uh, I like the theater because memory palaces, when you revisit them, they aren't exactly the same, and nothing right. nothing would be even a movie technically isn't the same because your cells are already changing, and maybe you have indigestion or you don't. Whatever, like it's not like there's a, mm -hmm. there's ever any return to the same. Not even Bill Murray, you know, <laughs> in Groundhog uh, yeah. Day has exactly the same passage to replay. But I, I I think that you're right. But what I what I want to seize upon here is a like let's just scale back and look at the problem which is not new in education because I don't want to romanticize the past, but it does seem mm -hmm. to be coming to be getting more and more of a pressing issue, which is the, the, a kind of, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot or make anybody feel bad, but just a cultural critique overall. And again, it might be a wrong one because the past may, may be more similar to now than, than uh, I think. But there just seems to be mm. like when you say, okay, it's like a movie or no, it's not like a movie. It's like a theater. There seems to be a growing need in the world to just have one way of thinking about a thing when the reality is, is that there are multiple ways of uh, approaching mm. a thing. So I don't know if you have a response to that and the response can be perfectly fine. No, Anthony, I don't know what you're talking about, but um, it, it seems like we're getting into this educational crisis, which has a lot to do with our algorithms constantly showing things and just have knocked people off track. John Michael Greer, a great memory master, calls it prosthetic imagination. We have so much imagination mm. handed to us that so many people are struggling to even take a second to imagine their own alternatives to things. So movie sure. doesn't work for me. Theater doesn't work for me. Instead of going, well, what might work for me? They're like, ah, oh, this is broken. Forget it. Like, mm -hmm. Just riff on that or, 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 or paradiddle on it as the case may be. <laughs> sure. Well, I think that, um, you know, if we look at it from a scientific perspective, why is it that we want to have an actor in the scene? Well, it's because our, evolved sense of facial recognition is so well it's just super highly evolved it's like you know you can imagine the 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 caveman who was like i can't tell if you're my mother or my mortal enemy uh didn't <laughs> last very long you know right, so right, right. we've have this highly developed facial um recognition and so uh 
Uh, if you want to call that an actor, you want to call that just a person or whatever. Uh, I think once you get the principle that really what we're he- we're dealing with here is that a face is easy to recognize. And so if you get a face to represent something real in Chinese, then it's going to help you remember compared to just trying to stare at the character over and over. Right. And uh, so that's one example, you know, there, and then, okay, 3d spatial imaging. How do we know where we are in a room? How do I know exactly how far away I am from the walls and stuff? Well, just this highly evolved, um, you know, brain of ours that had to deal with that problem all the time. And why we have, you know, we have really good vision, not quite as good as a, you know, a hawk, but uh, better than almost all animals. So it's like, we have this ability to tell where we are in space and know, you know, you can visit a place one time and then remember it and go, mm-hmm. I remember this room, like, even though I was only ever there once, right? You can still have this, these moments like that. And so again, we're just saying, this is what we're already good at. So we're just applying that and then we'll call it a set if that helps you wrap your head around it. But it, all that really matters is that there is a space that is representative of something because we're really good at recognizing spaces. So we're good at recognizing faces. We're good at recognizing spaces. All right, cool. Uh, core object recognition. The fact that I can recognize that something is a birthday cake and this is a baseball bat and like, you know, that's, this is a microphone. And I, I can conceptualize that really quickly. Well, you call that a prop if you want. Or you can just say, we're good at recognizing objects and differentiating between them. So if they represent a Chinese character component, then you're just making it easier on yourself. Like it's, again, comparing it to rote learning most of the time. So it's like, what we're trying to do is just say, we're good at faces, we're good at spaces, we're good at object recognition. And we also are naturally attracted to action and movement, right? And all these other things like, oh, it's glowing. It's, uh, you know, it's moving in slow motion. It's, uh, you know, the, the various things that would make us like sometimes with the memory palace, I don't know if you feel like this, but sometimes I can't believe how easy our brain is to like just trick almost or just be like, oh, I didn't quite remember the point of this scene. Let me just make the point of it glowing and bright. Oh, now I remember it every time. It seems so simple. It's like such a simple little step that you take. But you know, I digress. But I think that whatever the metaphor is, if as long as you know why you're doing it, uh, then uh, you know that can help with that. And also, the other thing about the metaphor is that a lot of times with people with Mandarin Blueprint, they've never heard of the Memory Palace, or if they've heard of it, it's like, oh, I saw Sherlock once or whatever, and they don't. They've never really applied it. And so, what we're just trying to do is be like, look. This isn't the whole point of the Mandarin Blueprint method. The, really, the whole point is to get you to understand messages as quickly as possible. So we don't want the problem to be that we're getting too sciencey about it. We just want to tell you something that is like easy for anybody to understand. Um, but we do we do offer it to people. We're like, if you want to understand the science that we uh, the uh, the best we understand it, here's some articles talking about you know facial recognition and things like that, some scientific papers and whatever. Um, but mostly just that the the metaphor is just meant to be like, okay, this is something that you can probably wrap your head around quickly. And if you'd never heard of it before, it shouldn't scare you away. Um, But if you want to find out more, here's what's really going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, It's such a interesting moment in, in the world and you have very, very good Mandarin and also, you know, very good skills, as I mentioned in the beginning with entrepreneurialism and you, you have a, a special visa you, I heard about that, you know, oh, yeah. you, were, yeah. you were able to, to acquire because of um, uh, your skills and talents yeah. in, in not just Chinese, but also in, uh, in, in entrepreneurialism, which um, I, I know uh, I have a little bit of insight in my own life because I've had similar visas granted because of this, that, and the other thing oh, yeah. uh, in that sense. So I just wonder as a, like a personal question, a fellow language learner, entrepreneur, where, where, how do you set your next goal? Like what's the, what's the wish for the next level, both in terms of the, the, the fluency that you have, because I correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that, you know, you don't feel like you're done yet in terms of knowing the language. And then likewise with Mandarin blueprint or in entrepreneurialism in general, how do you think about, planning the next level or where are you more Alan Watts Zen kind of just like the future, huh? This is just an image <laughs> that will cause me suffering. <laughs> and, and I yeah. just let it flow. I mean, how do you approach those kinds of things in life? Yeah. Well, regarding Mandarin, uh, there really is a point that you get to where 
uh, all you need to do is just keep taking it in. Um, and you know, obviously practice a bit too, but that just happens naturally in my life because of the relationships that I have. So I don't, I don't need to force the practice of output. I mean, I do do 10 minutes of Chinese writing every day, but it just feels like writing at this point. So, um, it doesn't really feel that much different. It's a little bit different, but you know, it's not crazy different. So with the Mandarin, all I need to do is just set my sort of minimums of, uh, going to make sure that I spend at least, I use uh, link you know, Steve Kaufman's uh, site. We just interviewed him yesterday. He's such a lovely guy. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I use Link because it just is an activity tracker. It's just sort of like, okay, you've been listening, you've been reading this stuff. Uh, and I put, you know, a Song of Ice and Fire in there. I like to read that before bed in Link. And, you know, just I can click on words and check them, whatever. But I just set a minimum of 40 minutes of actively immersing every day for sure. And that's all I really need to do. I don't need, I, I'm done with the other activities of learning the characters and, uh, you know, that type of thing. And so from a Mandarin perspective, that's also with Mandarin Blueprint, we're just trying to get people there. We're saying like, once you get to the point where you can just open up a crack, open a Chinese book or turn on a TV show and you understand it, then you no longer ever need to pay for anything to acquire Chinese. You know, it's like, you've got it at that point. So what, that's our goal is to get you from nothing to being at that place. So from a Mandarin perspective, that's all I do. I just make sure I come into contact with the language every day and I get better every day as a result. Now on the entrepreneurial side of the question. So one thing that I like to do a lot when I'm writing is ask what is the most important question right now? Uh, because it's a way of prioritizing all the things that are going on. You know, what, if, um, you know, for a while it was pretty obvious because it was like, well, we want to build out the Mandarin blueprint method to 3,050 characters and uh, make sure that all the vocabulary from the, all the HSKs is covered at some point uh, and um, you know, keep building it out that way. And then we did it. And it's now that exists. So it, it did get a little bit more like, okay, now what's the most important question? So I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of uh, uh, you know, listening to uh, different you know, I kind of move between different sources of learning. So it's like some stuff is entrepreneurial based, like books written by entrepreneurs who were successful or writers who were successful. We do a lot of writing. So there's that. Um, and then I'll also have some reading that I do. It's just stuff I'm interested in, like, I don't know, geop- geopolitics or something. That's kind of just like a relaxing thing to do. Then I do like sort of spiritual, um, spiritual learning in some way I was mentioning before. And I just make sure that this, this is a part of my day at some point. And oftentimes it's only 10 to 15 minutes of each, but as long as they happen every day over a year, that's a lot, right? So mm-hmm. um, that helps me ask the most important question. So you're, con- and of course, there's also the analysis of Mandarin Blueprint itself. You know, what kind of feedback are we getting from people? Are they telling us that something is not clear? Um, are, you know, what, and then there's like sort of the marketing metrics analysis, which I always find to be a little bit, difficult to figure out because you're not always clear. You you always have to figure out what is like, for example, you look at a click through rate on an email campaign and you go, well, the click through rate went down, but maybe that's a good thing. Actually, you know, it's like, sometimes you have to Mm -hmm. analyze things and go, not everything is just about numbers all the time. Sometimes it's about like, you know, for example, we spent a lot of time working on the SEO of our website, the search engine optimization. And then we realized though, it's not attracting the right type of people. So even though it was working, quote unquote, it actually was, it was a, getting the wrong types of people to arrive and therefore they weren't turning into uh, customers. So we realized, okay, well, that's fine. You know, it's like, it, it teaches you things about uh, that the, you can look at something and go, it, it's just this one thing, but no, it's really a system and the whole thing is a system. And so if you want to try to improve things in the system, Step one is to make sure they're congruent so that like the whole sort of thing is a, is a congruent uh, type of, you know, whether you're just finding out about Mandarin Blueprint or you're at character 3000, there's a congruency across that whole, whole uh, timeline. And so asking the most important question helps zero in on that, I think. And so you can kind of go, and it's hard sometimes, sometimes I'm like, what's the most important questions today for Mandarin Blueprint? I don't know. And then sometimes it's just the most important question today is how am I going to write this email that I have to do? (laughs) You know, and that's, it's simple, but then you finish your tasks and you go, okay, now though I could go a number of different directions. And so I just kind of 
try to trust that the inputs that I'm doing to educate myself better and the output of writing these things down and question, making these questions, I have a, you know, there's, I guess, a, a degree of, of faith in that and going like, I guess I'll trust my instincts here because I'm trying to give myself the right inputs. Uh, and again, it comes like, like, just like with language acquisition, you want to get better, keep inputting more uh, stuff and your brain will, you know, kind of naturally express the right thing similar with the entrepreneurial process. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. And, you know, to come back to where we started in your memory, what's your most blissful experience with learning this language, with creating products that are a process, a course that helps others learn the language. And then just as a third memory, your sort of favorite story from a, a person who's gone through Mandarin Blueprint that you just thought, that's it. This is, this is why we do this. If you uh, can just think of those three blissful things, whatever comes to mind. Right, right. Um, so you're saying the first one is just around the acquisition of language. Yeah, of the, you just that, yeah, because you sort of you sort of mentioned this this example where you're reading and you're realizing what, what's uh, you could solve the puzzle in in that. Mm -hmm. To me, that to me is always the most amazing thing when you don't have to look up in the dictionary. You go that that most almost certainly is 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 what I think it is, and then you just sort of carry on. I mean, maybe you already gave that example. Yeah. But, just, just those kinds of blissful moments in, in these categories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if for sure, if this is number one, but one, the one that jumps out to me is, uh, you know, when I was writing my graduation thesis, which actually was the thing that led to the entrepreneurship visa. So like we brought that up earlier that I got granted that visa. And that was because I wrote this thesis that got an award and that award led to me getting the entrepreneurship visa. And while I was writing the thesis in Chinese for my uh, Sichuan University, I, um, I, I like I was it, it's so cool how after you get enough in, but it just comes out like you just start writing and you're just like, I want to write about the, a better way to learn Chinese. Uh, I was kind of criticizing the whole university system in the thesis, which I thought it was kind of humble of them to be like, well, we'll award you because, you know, mm -hmm. basically a big, a big criticism of the way they approach it. But I, I was, as I was writing it out, I was just, um, I, I, to some degree, I couldn't believe it, that I was like, I just wrote a page of Chinese and like, and then eventually, you know, a 70 page thesis and like, uh, it, it just kind of flowed out of me. And that was one of those things where I thought, this is amazing. Like the, the human brain is so um, fantastic. If you can just give it the right food, you know, uh, it'll, it'll, like I said before, you know, expression is the emergent property of understanding. So the more you understand, you will eventually be able to express yourself. So that was, that's probably one for Mandarin. And then in building Mandarin blueprint, uh, there's just been so many moments of, seeing like just those epiphany moments of like, Oh, this is going to help people. Like, this is really going to work like this. If I build, like, I, I just remember going the, the day that I realized, well, wait a second, if we can teach the pronunciation, then you could do this all in one system. You could travel from pronunciation into character components, into components, into words, into sentences, into paragraphs, into stories until you're just reading long passages of Chinese. And then you can just go be free in Chinese and like we can take them right. And like realizing that that was happening. And then of course, actually building it out and uh, see, you know, seeing it come together. And then, you know, that sort of relates to the feeling, the sort of third question, which is then people go through it and they keep saying like, well, sometimes they just express direct gratitude and they're like, this, this is great. I've done this. But then what I like even almost more than that is just, people helping each other out. People are constantly leaving comments that are helping somebody who will come later. It's a pay it forward thing every time because they're not, they're, they're just writing it to leave somebody else a, a suggestion. They're like, Oh, I found that this word uh, connects for me. Uh, you know, I think of this, uh, this movie scene that's really famous. And so maybe somebody has seen that movie and it'll help them remember the word or, you know, uh, so I, I particularly like it when people leave suggestions that I've never heard of. Cause I'm like, like a lot of people leave anime suggestions. I never watched anime really. So like, I'll be like, yeah, that'd be great for the anime fans. And, but yeah, like just yesterday, 
we had, cause we only released the advanced course a few months ago uh, that takes it out to 3050. And yesterday we got a long email from Jimmy being like, I did, it. I learned the 3050 characters first one to get all the way through. And uh, you know, I was just like, yeah, yes. <laughs> like, it was just this great moment because I was like, he, you know, he, he now knows those characters, like, you know, they're, they're a part of him now and he's only going to get better from here. And I have no doubt about it. And so it's like, that is just a, it's a very beautiful thing to see people have that type of success. Um, and, uh, you know, have had many moments like that. Uh, you know, we had this guy, Keith, before we finished the advanced course, he's like, I swear he's probably, uh, on the approaching genius level IQ, but he was, he did like a thousand characters in 11 days. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, like that's just really, really good stuff. And so, cool, cool. yeah, plenty of stories like that. There's too many to count, but yeah. Well, Phil, thank you so much. I mean, I wish you continued bliss and ever growing bliss in so far as there's no ceiling to these things, it seems. And uh, yeah. thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and conversation. And, you know, people can find you at mandarinblueprint.com. Is that the correct um, link? Yep, mandarinblueprint.com. You yeah, know, we have a podcast every two weeks um, that you can check out uh, from our website. And of course, you can uh, feel free to start a free trial of the Mandarin Blueprint method. Um, it's uh, it's pretty fun, and uh, obviously, do it if you're uh, like you know. I, I would not say it's for dabblers. If you're into dabbling with Mandarin, you know, Babel or Duolingo or Rosetta Stone, great. But if you are serious about it, and you're like, I want to uh, take my Mandarin to the next level and really become um, somebody who's not just like knows a little bit of Chinese, but is properly fluent and literate. Um, and you're willing to put in, you know, 30 minutes to an hour every day, uh, then you're going to have a great time. You're going to, you're definitely going to get better. Right. So I'm so glad you mentioned that because really dabbling is almost the opposite of bliss. It's like yeah. guaranteeing <laughs> that pull of entropy <laughs> in, in each yeah. and every way. But when you're, you, when you're on it, you know, that's, that's where things really, really switch on. So great, uh, great distinguishing factor there. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Anthony. Well, I want to thank Phil again for sharing with us the journey with Mandarin Blueprint and so much about what they've done and the thinking behind how they've innovated some of the Heisek material and other aspects of memory techniques that have pre-existed and it is absolutely revolutionary and I hope you start to think about it and how those ideas apply to your own practice and consider going deeper into the Mandarin Blueprint world. I think that, you know, it's definitely focused on Mandarin, but some of those ideas, if you need more exposure to it, you'll see how they map onto what you're doing in any language as you reconfigure what's possible in your thinking. And there's even more thinking yet to come. So thanks for being subscribed. And if you aren't subscribed, get subscribed. And thanks for hitting that thumbs up to let the robots know we still care, us humans, about the great memory tradition. And let us go together, you and I, deeper and deeper into this. And I can't wait to have yet another discussion with you and whoever we might interview or whatever topic we might be talking about here on the Magnetic Memory Method YouTube channel or wherever you're listening to this on the podcast, etc. And whatever you do, go out there and make this the day that you spent time with your memory. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep that memory magnetic.